Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Health Babes podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Becky Campbell with Dr. Crystal Hone. Today, we have Dr. Maritza Snyder on. She is a functional medicine practitioner and a woman's hormone expert and the author of eight books. So her newest book is called The Essential Oils Menopause Solution. And this book focuses on solutions for women in perimenopause and menopause. And the number one national best-selling book, The Essential Oils Hormone Solution, which focuses on balancing women's hormones naturally. So let's welcome Dr. Maritza to the show. Hey, everyone. Let's welcome Dr. Maritza to the show. We have known each other for a while now since... I think you're for before your first book came out, right? Probably, yeah, probably 2016, 2017 is what I'm yeah. going to guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. And we are so excited about this episode because what you do is so unique. So let's just jump right in and we're going to talk a lot about perimenopause and menopause. Um, there's just a lot of information that people don't have. So we're super excited to have you. So let's talk about how you got interested in all this. Like what led you to working with women's hormone health in perimenopause and menopause? Well, I started way before I was in perimenopause. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) Like so many other women that I connect with and meet with, um, I was an avid stressaholic. And really a lot of that stress came from trauma from an early age. I was abused as a child and my, I always thought that my worth was based on my productivity. And so man, was I a very productive woman. And one of the things I was also taught at a very young age is one, your period and your menstrual cycle, they're a hindrance they're a burden, like deal with them when you have to deal with them, obviously once a month, but like do what you need to do. Like, don't let them be the reason why you don't get your stuff done. And so I ignored my body for years. I I pretended like it was not my friend. Um, I was very cerebral. I was constantly on the go and you know, those, those crazy gym workouts right before my period, I would just grunt my way through it. I would just like negatively self-talk my way through that workout that day. And ultimately I did this throughout my, gosh, even in high school, I just ran from one thing to the next. My twenties were a blur of, of accolades and just, just pushing and pushing and pushing in survival mode. So then at 30 years old, my body just completely gave in. I had put on a ton of weight. What I didn't know at the time was I was probably severely insulin resistant um, yeah. I had severe chronic stress um, and basically was diagnosed with, um, with, with chronic fatigue syndrome. I could not get out of bed. I could not get to my practice. I had a hard time seeing patients. Um, I was foggy. I was moody and irritable and angry. And um, I just knew that at 30 years old, this is not how someone's supposed to, this is not how we're supposed to feel. It's not how I was supposed to feel. And so, but every time I went to a different doctor, especially a women's hormone doctor, and this was back in like uh, 2009, let's just say 2009. We, we still, that was a while ago, let's be honest. And, yeah. and every time I would go, it was always, it was always Xanax. It was always birth control pills. It was always just masculine symptoms. It was always you're stressed out. You know, it was, always, you know, it was, it was just the same BS advice that we're, the women are still getting today. Let's be honest, like this, especially the demographic that we're going to be talking about women in perimenopause and menopause, that is the quick fix. Like, let's get you on some anti-anxiety medication. Let's get you on some birth control pills and like, you know, and and good luck. Like, we'll see you later. And so it was in that moment that I, I think it was a third doctor I'd been to same prescriptions. And I was just like, I'm over this. Like, I've got to figure this out. And before I was a doctor, I was actually a biochemist. And so I knew how to do research and I decided to really dive in and not only focus on myself, but then I, I just, I knew that I needed to be a part of the solution. I'd always been in love with women. I always knew that women ran the world. Obviously that's what I thought I was doing the whole time. And yeah. so I wanted to help women feel like they were thriving in their body so they could go and execute at a high level. Um, but through their body, like using their body, their body as an unfair advantage versus shoving it to the wayside to just pl- plow through kind of like a, a very patriarchal way of operating in the world. Like I had done. Yeah. Like a lot of us, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Oh no. I'm, I'm one of many, mm-hmm. one yeah. of many. <laughs> so what were some of those things when you started to feel all of that, even with, you know, early in practice, like you said, and you were so fatigued, what did you do to kind of get yourself out of that? I feel the first piece I did was I was nutrition. I, yeah. I, you know, even, even when I thought I was eating well, it was still process, more processed than not. 
And so I started with green smoothies. I started with adding in more protein. Um, I'm just really focusing on, you know, clean proteins, clean, clean, healthy fats, and lots and lots and lots of fiber. I knew that my gut and my liver needed a major reset. And I was estrogenic. I was driving. I mean, I had, I, I had literally menopausal levels of progesterone at that time. And I had severe estrogen dominance. I remember growing up, my mom would always say that, you know, our family, we just don't have progesterone. And, you know, this, the girls, the women in our family, we don't have progesterone. I was like, that doesn't even, I didn't know at the time. I just took it for face value. I was like, okay, that's just how it operates in my family. So it was like, again, there was a lot of normalizing, you know, oh, you're just yeah. going to be estrogen dominant. Not that we knew what that was, but just like your periods are going to suck. You're going to have severe PMS symptoms. You're going to be super moody and nasty to people. Like, it's just, this is how it is for our family. And Absolutely. Every single one of my family has had low progesterone levels, but it was this trauma spiral, this survival spiral, you know, that we were in that obviously plummeted you oh, know, yeah. our, our progesterone levels. And so um, it, there was a root cause there was, it wasn't just like, oh, this is just the way it is. Um, so food was the big piece. And then I started with adaptogenic herbs. I was really trying to heal my HPA axis, my, my hypothalamic pituitary, basically the stress response system that had been in overdrive. Gosh, since I was 12 years old, since as, as long as I could remember, I was racing from something or racing to something. And so holy basil, ashwagandha, rhodiola were mainstays for me. And then I, I started with just, cause I was doing really hardcore workouts, hardcore. So I, I, I just stepped it back significantly and it was walking, it was yoga, it was Pilates initially. And then, um, I, I got rid of a lot of the, a lot of what was driving my survival mode. It was a long process. Cause I'll tell you what, like you can, you can't green smoothie your way out of chronic stress. Yeah. Yeah, no. so that, <laughs> that just kept that. Hap- I was like overachieving this health journey. And then I was like, what the, why am I back where I started again? And then realized I was literally just operating myself back into my situation just because that was my, def- my default mode. I was like overachieving my health. And so I finally, I, I let go of a lot of obligations that I said yes to because, and I don't know why, because I hated doing them. I, I let go. I hated. It was so many things that I did every day that I hated that I like yeah. signed up for. I, you know, like volunteer projects for some. You know, it was just a bunch of stuff. I was on committees to things, and I was have every night. I had to go to something, and I was like, I don't even want to be here. Yeah. Um, I significantly it's, alcohol was a big part of this journey too. I had yeah. significantly. De- decreased in alcohol, I realized real quick, it was not doing me any favors. Mm -hmm. Uh, So those were some of the big things, but nutrition was the mainstay. And then really starting to heal my, my, my stressaholic ways. Uh, That was, that was, and I still, I I have a CGM on right now. You guys can't see it. And yesterday um, I got into my rushing women mode, you know, I I was, I was handling business and I was, I thought, and my husband's like, you know, maybe he caught me until like, and I'll cut around him, like, cut, cut, like, like my, like my toddler does right now, like zooming through the rooms. I was, and Alex is like, "Ah, maybe you don't need to be in such a rush. I'm like, don't talk to me. I got like, don't even get in my way right now because you're going to slow me down. Like, and it's such a default mode. And so, um, I'm racing to get meeting up with a best friend, right? I got a podcast. I got this, I got that. I got a gym appointment and I got to get showered and get over to her by like 12 o'clock, by the way, I don't make it till 12, 15. So, um, <laughs> I check my CGM. I hadn't eaten all, all day, all, you know, okay. except for a little teeny protein shake before the workout. And this was like heavyweight training, you know, and even that didn't raise my blood sugar that much. It got jumped up to like 110 milligrams per deciliter. But yeah. that rushing moment, that 45 minutes where I was, it hopped 42 degree, it hopped 42 milligrams per deciliter. Like it was, it was my only spike for the day. Oh. It was it. And I was like, oh, shoot. Like I just, <laughs> I was like, oh, like that. And that was 100% stress driven, you yeah. know, um, blood sugar spike. And so it was a, I, I rarely have those today, but man, it was such a wake up call for me yesterday. Like I, I used to leverage stress as my, what I called my slight edge power or, oh yeah. Or I'm like, mm, let me, I got let me, this. It's my zone. Nobody, nobody's yeah. got me. Like I'm going <laughs> to kick her butt. Like whatever it was, like no one can outstress and out like adrenaline me. And yeah. so I was kicking in all that adrenaline yesterday and it really did feel good. Cause I am, I do have like an addiction to it. It's rarely a situation these days, but I saw it on the CGM and I'll tell you what numbers don't lie. 
numbers don't lie. And it was just a real slap in the face of like, that's not good for you. Like you can't be doing that, you know, ever, you know, so, and there was a cookie with it. That's like a cookie spike. You know what I'm saying? I didn't have a cookie. No, (laughs) that was stress. There was no cookies involved. There was no cookies involved. When I had my CGM on and I'm very like busy in the mornings, getting the kids off the school, getting workouts. Sometimes I can't get like a full complete meal. So I'll get some quick protein in and then you're doing a big workout. Got to rush and get ready before work. And boom, like you just see that, that fasting blood glucose go so high. And it's true. Stress is a killer. It is is. a big, big thing. So it's insidious too. You know, I I find it's been, it's my number one. If if we were to like, like what is the biggest, uh, you know, hormonal imbalance that I have dealt with my whole life is definitely cortisol. Um, And, you know, it it is on the hierarchy. It's, it's a major player, huge. And once I got to my best friend and we were hugging and connecting and we were walking around, we're at the mall, the UTC mall in La Jolla obviously oxytocin kicked in. Thank God for her. And everything was all right in the world. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> when I was in college, um, I was, you know, under an enormous amount of stress and I worked out so hard and I was gaining weight and I oh, had yeah. to do the same thing. I had to stop and start doing Pilates, which was torture for me because I, yeah, I don't I like Pilates. that. I no, yeah. Just- <laughs> I had to stop running, which I loved running. And I had to really like walk and do Pilates and it was boring, but it, it did help because I was just pumping out so much cortisol all the time. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it, when you said that, it really made me remember that time oh, yeah. in my life too. I remember when I was doing orange theory classes, this was in my thirties and I I had built up some metabolic resilience. I was doing great. I was lean. It was right after my wedding and I had, you know, got, I got into the size zero wedding dress, you know, for, for my wedding and everything. And and right after that, I had turned 35 and it felt like the whole, the wheels fell off. What had happened to me back in my twenties finally really came back. Um, I had had low grade Hajimoto's and didn't know it, mm-hmm. but I was doing these orange theory workouts. Cause I was trying to drop this little extra weight that I, that was just coming on out of nowhere after, after my, I was like thin, gorgeous for the wedding. Not that I'm, you know, I'm so gorgeous then too, but like, you know, then all of a sudden, so I'm, I'm doing two orange theory workouts some days and I am winded. I am exhausted. I am irritated. And I just watch the numbers on the scale go up and I'm just trying to over exercise myself you know, it's so funny, even when we know some of the things that we know, you know, you start to see shifts and changes in your body and you can go back to some of those body beating habits. And so, but yeah, it, it, I've, I've definitely had to like, um, especially now with Hajimoto's and that, you know, really shift so much about how I operate. And I think wearables, I hope we get into wearables today. Again, I, I so often, especially when we wear so many hats as women and we're taking care of everybody and everything, I, I feel like without a wearable, I, I would try to get away with more stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. do you want to explain what that is for listeners who don't know? Absolutely. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the, so I would say a wearable is a form of biohacking. Yeah. Female centric biohacking. <laughs> Um, and, um, like even a a great female centric biohacking is, you know, um, is a thermometer, you know, measuring your, your basal temperature every single day to track your period. Um, but another wearable would be like a whoop strap where you get a body recovery score and an HRV score. Well, I, you know, you can get, so (laughs) I, I find some people are like, you know what? I just won't wear that because it's so discouraging. (laughs) It's so good to know. It's so good to Where know. Oh at. my gosh, absolutely. So uh, I love whoop. I don't have my whoop strap on right this second, but I love whoop strap. It looks at your your sleep in such a, an in-depth way. Obviously, Aura Ring can do this as well, but it gives you a body recovery score. So you kind of know what you have capacity for that day. Like it, it kind of determines my workout for the day of like, oh, I'm not, my whoop score does not look that great. I was yeah. up with my baby too much last night. So I'm going to tailor my workout based on that. Um, another wearable I love, I, I also have a Fitbit on because whoop strap does not track your steps. I think it's nice to have that as well. And I think like se- at least 7,500 steps a day is like magic for us women. And then I also love wearing the CGM It's probably one of the most profound wearables that I have a glucose monitor. Um, and obviously you can get a glucose meter that's much cheaper, but it, in real time, 24 freaking seven, you can look at where your blood sugar is and yeah. where I look at it. I, I look at it all the time, but two areas that I look at is right before bed. 
um, after my, after dinner and then right before bed. So I kind of want to see what my baseline blood sugar is going into sleep. Um, and then I want to be looking at it right up in the morning, my fasting blood sugar as well. Um, so that kind of information can tell me, you know, is sleep playing a role in my blood sugar, you know, th those kind of things that kind of information I think is so, so critical because again, sleep is such a major issue for many of us. You know, you have this information that can tell you what's going on with your body. It can, it's a real wake up call. It's a real, like in your face, staring at you. This is what's happening with your body. This is your recovery or lack thereof. It's, it, you know, and you can make changes in real time based on that data that you're getting. And I love the ability to be able to measure my menstrual cycle, my, you know, my, my, my HRV, my heart rate variability, my steps, my blood sugar, my body recovery score, all of those things. So that I can adapt every day based on the information that I'm given. Yeah. And crystals was, has been wearing the aura ring for a while and she got me into it. And I love this thing because it does your steps. It does your body temperature, you know, basal body temperature. So, you know, I, you can see really like when you ovulated and all this, I mean, it's so much information and then, you know, what you can put your workouts in. And I love the HRV because that's something that we know if you're stressed, that's going to be really affected. So if our HRV is getting low and Crystal and I, like, we share screenshots of our, it's like, we're struggling our, today back. Yeah. Right, I'm then. like, look at my HRV. I need to like, you know, take, take a day off or whatever. Yeah. And I noticed too, with alcohol, like if I have like any oh, yeah. alcohol, my yes. HRV plummets. So I was going to say, can we talk about alcohol and yes. HRV and sleep score and blood sure. sugar? Oh my God. Like, it's like variability. It's the worst. Yeah. Um, my commitment to myself this year is I'm not drinking for the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the reasons why I, I stepped into that, I haven't been drinking mostly for the last three to four years, especially trying to get ready to getting pregnant. And then obviously during throughout the pregnancy. And then I've been, I'm still breastfeeding today. So, yeah. you know, for me, it's just, it's been very, very rare, probably, you know, I, you know, from 19 to 21, it was probably less than my two hands, how many drinks I had. Yeah. But I also noticed every time I had a drink, I would tell my husband the next day, like, man, the juice was not worth the squeeze. <laughs> it wasn't worth it. But then I would go out with my girls or there would be some really epic event, like three, two months later down the line. And I would have that glass of champagne or I, whatever cocktail it was. And then I would say the same thing the next morning, every single time. And so we were in Hawaii um, back in February. And I, I'm not going to lie. I have a little bit of a love affair with my ties, especially some sexy <laughs> ones. And I get, it's just straight sugar. I know what's in them. I was a bartender. Delicious, right? <laughs> They're so delicious. And there's this place that makes the most, like, it's like from, like early 1900s, right? Like the Mai Tai. Yeah. And so I was like, I'm going to have, I'm going to have one. And I told myself that I was going to be really observant of the experience. And so I had one, a little over one and almost one and a half. And I sat with it for the hour and I noticed I got, I felt myself getting a little bit more irritated. Mm -hmm. I felt myself getting a little bit more uncomfortable. And then the next morning I was walking Kingston on the beach. We had our smoothies. I had my almond milk cappuccino and I just sat with it because I felt a little groggy. I just I didn't feel like I could my hundred percent self and you know, my son and I, and everybody that deserves a hundred percent me. And so I sat there on the beach while Kingston was building his sandcastle. And I was like, you know what? It ain't worth it. It's not worth it. I'm putting it, I'm, I'm shelving it for the rest of the year. And the reason why I shelved it, shelved it was because I know how easy it would be in two months time. If I didn't just put it on the shelf that I could be convinced by a best friend or, you know, somebody, my husband, <laughs> goodness, <Yeah. laughs> um, to go and have that little, that just that one little drink or just that half a little drink. And someone yeah. would make it all pretty for me and give it to me and be so sweet about it. And if it was just like, it's a hell no, it's a, yeah. it's, it, I am yeah. not available for that this year. Um, yeah. I knew I would cave, you know? Yeah. yeah. And it, like, like for me, it makes that. me feel really jittery later. Cause it's, uh, you know, people think it's a depressant, it's a stimulant. So a, yeah after, you know, two hours, I start to get like internal shaking. It just feels bad. And, and it impacts your sleep. Like your sleep. Oh, okay. oh, oh, yeah. I don't think I didn't look at all my wearables that day. I yeah. looked at my, my HRV was in the crapper, my blood sugar. It took a day and a half for it to recover. And that's yeah. what I don't think people realize is that your blood sugar isn't gonna, it's not going to just bounce back in a couple of hours. It could take up to 36 to 48 hours to recover from, you know, a half a glass, a half a bottle of wine 
or, you know, a couple glasses of champagne or a couple of Mai Tais. Well, definitely it's going to take 48 hours to recover from some Mai Tais because yeah. of all that sugar too. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I think when women start to see that, um, especially in their numbers, you know, you, you really start to second guess whether it is, it is showing up for you or doing anything in a positive direction that would, that would like, you know, make up for the fact that it's literally tanking <laughs> your yeah. system and causing inflammation in the body. Yeah. So for the, you know, moral of the story is if you have any trouble not doing certain things that, you know, affect you wear these things because they really help keep you accountable because the more information you have, it's really hard to ignore that, you know? Yeah. So I love, we love those too. So let's talk about, let's go into menopause a little bit. So, you know, there's a lot of things about menopause that are misunderstood, right? By women and even doctors. So can you get into that a little bit? Like Absolutely. why, why do you think it's so misunderstood? Oh, I can tell you exactly why it's so misunderstood because <laughs> <laughs> men didn't care. Yeah. Um, that's why, you know, you think about our medical system, I'm just going to be straight up with, you know, it's created by men. And if, if, if you were the ones who were creating it and you were running the research, who would you be interested in yourself, right. yourself? And we also, as a society have felt that it's diminishing returns once women get into menopause because they're not baby factories anymore. And so we just thought, eh, okay. you know, and so we, I remember that we weren't even interested in symptoms of menopause until like the 1930s, really when Premarin was being developed. And all of a sudden, every symptom that a woman had Premarin, 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 like, let's just give you some horse urine in the form of synthetic estrogen and call it a day. Um, and so that's really the reason in a nutshell is that we just hadn't focused the, the research or the diagnostics around women's health, particularly after they weren't fertile anymore. I mm -hmm. mean, you think about even in terms of treatment for PCOS and endometriosis today, we favor women who are using PCOS treatment and endometriosis treatment as a form of trying to get pregnant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If it's just because you are in pain, hmm, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's normal pain. Maybe that's a normal experience, you know, but if you're trying to get pregnant, oh, 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 then okay, we'll, we'll help you. Yeah. yeah. And I, I find too, you know, menopause and like perimenopause shifting into menopause, it's not as celebrated. Women are like, oh gosh, I can't believe I I'm, I'm getting there. It's like, it's, it should be celebrated. You know, you made it and there's so many, your life can is still beautiful and you're still producing hormones and you're still sexy and all the things, right. We need to, we need to celebrate that, but it really is looked a little bit more down upon. So what are some of those menopause myths that we really need to debunk? Well, the first one, I think we just talked about, which is that we, it's, we are, we are diminishing. You know, we are, it, it's, it's, it's over. We're just going over the hill. That is not true whatsoever. Yes. Hormones are shifting. Yes. Some of our sex hormones are not going to be at the levels that they were, but there are a lot of hormones that are driving our longevity, our energy, our metabolic function that are going to have us thriving for years to come. Um, another myth that I believe, you know, is, is, is one that I'm hoping to debunk is that, you know, it, it, you do have to just, you know, s take pills to manage your symptoms, whether it's birth control pills. I cannot tell you how many times I meet women in menopause on birth control pills because they were put on in late stage perimenopause to manage the estrogen ebbs and flows right. and swings. Um, and then, or an antidepressant, you know, and, and it's just, it's, it's so dis discerning or dis discon. So it's just, I'm like thinking it's, it's, well, it's upsetting is what it is. Yeah. Um, and you know, we are, it's lazy medicine is what it is. Mm -hmm. And so letting women know that there are actually true natural, you know, integrative solutions that they can implement to help move through that perimenopausal transition and to really set themselves up for success moving forward. Um, another myth that I, I love to dismiss is that, um, that we are, after we get through menopause, that weight gain is inevitable. Right. Um, now do, 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 does our metabolism change? Do we lose some of those metabolic, um, protections once we estrogen and testosterone and progesterone drop? Yes, but we can absolutely mitigate that not only before perimenopause and throughout perimenopause, but even afterwards, I think it's really understanding how our bodies work Our the other important hormones, like our metabolic hormones, like insulin, ghrelin, leptin, growth hormone, how we can optimize testosterone. These are hormones that we have lever levers that we can pull also ensuring that we are keeping 
cortisol at bay. But just because we lose, lose progesterone and estrogen precipitously doesn't mean that we don't have other levels that we can pull to ensure we feel great moving into perimenopause and menopause. And then I think it's, you know, it's, it's a mindset shift. We, we have to start believing, as you said, that we are, we, we can feel good. We get to feel good. We get to step into this new realm. That doesn't mean that we don't, that we shouldn't get to mourn that right. part of ourselves. I absolutely think that we should, we should take some time and reflect and really go into, into just kind of asking ourselves some important questions of like, who do I need to become to step into this new self? You know, what are some of the passions that I want to explore? How can I support my body metabolically so that I'm thriving into my 60s and 70s and beyond? And just getting really clear about like, who, you know, what are the things that I want to be doing? How do I want to show up for people? You know, what, what, what parts of me do I want to bring into the next phase? And what parts of me am I okay of letting go with, or like, like just letting that go? And so I think the more that we can get clear about who we become and we set an intention heading into menopause, it really shifts the game because now we've got a different purpose. We've got a different path. Um, and it's not just like, oh, this, this massive part of my life is over. And now that it's gone, you know, I, you know, I, I'm just kind of, it's the, the leftover of that part of my life is now what I'm looking forward to. So I yeah. think it's very much a shift. And also just to give kind of some, some, context, we, we spend half of our life in perimenopause and menopause and postmenopause, if you want to call it. So it's a big chunk of our life. And I think we it just have to frame that too, of like, we're going to spend a lot of time here. So how do we make it the best for ourselves and, and really optimize our body so that we feel phenomenal moving into it? What do you think about, um, hormone replacement therapy to manage menopause? I love it. I love it. But but that's like, there's a caveat there. Um, and that is, you know, if we're just recommending bioidentical hormones to address insulin resistance and to address a metabolic issue and to address cortisol, you know, some of the other bigger drivers or to address a sluggish liver and an unhappy gut, like that ain't going to get the job done. Yeah. So it needs to be in accordance to, and, you know, we've working on those major foundational pieces and then kind of adding a little bit of bioidenticals. Again, it's very personalized to every single woman, but I think it can be super, super helpful. Um, we know that a decline in estrogen puts us at a greater risk for cardiometabolic disease. We are, and, and I know you guys probably know this, but we are, we, we die of cardiovascular disease more than men. Um, we are 75% of the case of, of Alzheimer's. We are 75% of autoimmune cases. I mean, the numbers are staggering. Like it is not in our favor. And so the more that we can get as much protection as we can, again, working with a practitioner, specifically working with our body um, and pulling the levers around our metabolic health, I think that we would feel a lot better moving through menopause and we would mitigate a lot of those cardiometabolic risk factors as we, as we head closer into that into that range of where those things are concerning. Absolutely. I agree. I, we wholeheartedly agree with that. So for, you know, women who are listening in that transition phase, right. From perimenopause to menopause, what are some things that they can do to take ownership of their health and to really make that transition smooth and empowering? Absolutely. That's such a great question. We still have our cycle yeah. then I still got mine. <laughs> and so I think really knowing our cycle and honoring our cycle is going to be so important here because it's going to be changing and it's going to be shortening, right? The luteal phase of our menstrual cycle is going to be shortening. Progesterone has precipitously dropped at this point. Testosterone has definitely dropped at this point. And so really just kind of knowing what's going on so that we can have this litmus, litmus test of like showing us what's going on with our bodies as it's changing and flowing. The next thing I think is really important is that we get a full workup. We have a baseline of what we're working with. And honestly, as soon as our mid thirties, cause that's when I feel like women start to feel a shift. You know, we are looking at our, a full lipid panel um, where we're looking at low density, low density lipoproteins, like small and large. We're just looking at where all the pieces are triglyceride levels, a uh, fasting insulin, fasting glucose, hemoglobin, a one C C reactive protein growth hormone, you know, we want to just see all of these markers that kind of just see where we're at. And then ideally, if you can afford it, bring on some of the wearables too, to kind of just start tracking. But where I see things really like where we can really, really, um, preventatively improve 
you know, our cardio metabolic risk factors is making sure that our blood sugar is balanced, yeah. making sure that we keep insulin sensitive, um, making sure that we are loving up on our gut and our liver so that yeah. we, so that estrogen is being properly metabolized. Caffeine is being properly metabolized, you know, in that, um, and that our, you know, our estrobolome and our microbiome is diverse and happy and healthy, um, keeping stress at bay. So mastering our stress response system, whether that's with adaptogenic herbs or meditation or walking outside, um, optimizing our circadian rhythm. And that includes sleep ladies. I'm talking to you. You know, if you are trying to get, if you're trying to optimize or get eight hours of sleep at night, let's just say you, and you reverse engineer 6am wake up, um, you got to be in bed by 9pm to go to sleep at 10 PM. So I think a lot of us don't, you, you always think, okay, I'm going to get eight hours. So I'm going to go to bed right at 10. Mm -mm. That's going to maybe, maybe you're going to clear seven, you know? And if you yeah. have an aura ring or a whoop strap, you're going to see those numbers on, it's going to say like 6.53 hours of sleep, right? And we yes. know that anything under seven puts us at detrimental risk for more greater insulin resistance and blood sugar variability. And then in terms of movement, you know, get outside and walk, get that fresh air, you know, especially in the morning, if you can to boost that cortisol awakening response and, and up level your mitochondria. And then in terms of uh, also in terms of movement is lift heavy weights. If you can do it like, and it's, and it's smaller, you know, so that's with, a, as a woman with Hajimoto, so an autoimmune condition suffering from, you know, from, from stressaholic syndrome back in the day. <laughs> You know, when I, when I look at where the juice is worth the squeeze, it's walking and it's resistance training so that I can maintain that muscle mass, because what we know to be true is that insulin resistance starts in the muscles. So, and we're, and we're losing them, right? We're losing our muscle mass by like five to 8% starting in our thirties and moving forward. So those would be the big things that I would be recommending to women is, you know, again, balancing your blood sugar getting, making sure that you optimize your circadian rhythms, making sure that you are moving your body in a way that's going to preserve your muscle mass or build your muscle mass, track your cycle so that you know what's going on and mastering your stress and sleep as much as possible. I think those are the lifestyle levers that I think are going to make the biggest impact. Yeah. We can bring in adaptogenic herbs. Yes. We can bring in supplementation, which I think are great. Um, and you know, obviously a develop a really powerful and great mindset, but in terms of the health levers, I think that those make the biggest, the biggest difference, especially as we segue into perimenopause and menopause. So if you had to say, this is my number one thing I would say to, to start with, you know, yeah. someone's like, where do I start with all that? What would you say? I would say balance your blood sugar. Mm -hmm. I would say getting your blood sugar under control. It's yeah. true because, because most body. of us don't know it's out of control. They have yeah. no idea, but you get uh, those mood swings or you get really fatigued out of nowhere and you don't know what it is. It's your blood sugar. It's your blood sugar. <laughs> it's, it it's, is. we are, I mean, I was, when I looked back and I thought about my twenties and how irritable and hangry and how it would have like a kind bar at 11 AM, you know, yeah. I, I was literally on, I think a perpetual blood sugar roller coaster for a decade. Me too. I, 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 and I had no idea. And I thought it was just stress. Now, yes, stress was a major player. I'm not going to dismiss stress by any means. And probably one of the bigger drivers of my blood sugar roller coaster. But we, we're just, we're told that it's not a big issue. I cannot tell you how many women I meet and see with a hemoglobin A1C of 5.7, 5.8. And they hadn't been told that they're, they're pre-diabetic. Right. Not one, not one of them, because it just wasn't at a, it wasn't diabetes. Yep. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Or I, I it's low and they're told, oh, you're, you're good. Your blood <laughs> sugar is low. <laughs> I don't know why I'm passing out or feeling like I'm going to pass out a million times a day. Right. It's, it's, yeah. it's true that people don't know. And it's, and it's true too, when your blood sugar is dysregulated, your body, your body is in a state of stress. It can't concentrate on anything else that's trying to regulate. So can you imagine what the body can do once that regulation is there? So the body is powerful. It's very smart. Oh yeah. So I know that you're really into essential oils. Can you, I am. yes. Can you give listeners some top you know, some of your favorite oils, especially for perimenopause and menopause, because I absolutely love them too. Well, and let me just a little bit of context around essential oils is I think that yeah. they're just, 
the powerful yeah. helpers and initiators. You know, I am a big proponent. Uh, you know, when I look at all the women that I take care of, I look at the women in my life and my family, we're doing the most, we're doing all the things, even when you're tracking your blood sugar and you're watching your aura ring and you're doing, you know, you're tracking everything and you're trying to do the best for, around your health. You're still juggling so many other aspects of it, of your life. And so you know, when it, when it comes to essential oils, I believe that we deserve as many instant wins as possible, like all the instant wins, like hook me up. And so, um, I have a little diffuser in my, in our bathrooms. It's a little poof diffuser. So it's, it's emotion censored. Mm -hmm. And so anytime you walk by it, it'll just puff at you. And wow. so, um, we have citrus oils in all of these beautiful little puff diffusers and I walk in and I always think of citrus, like especially wild orange or a, a grapefruit or a bergamot. Oh, it's like dreamy. It it's really like, is. Oh yeah. A burst of like happy and joy. So I'll just like walk it. It'll poof at me and I'll just like bring it on over, you know, cause it just feels so good. And now it gives me an opportunity to like breathe and pause and relax and just like, just savor the moment of this beautiful aromatherapy. And so the reason why I fell in love with essential oils is that they were very few things in terms of what we were doing around our health that really felt like instant wins. I mean, honestly, the only thing that's really an instant win is a, is a drug. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what else delivers, you know, an instant yeah. and, and a cupcake or a cookie, you know what I'm saying? Like, like it's either a sugar drug or it's a real pharmaceutical. There's very few things out there. And so when I discovered oils, I was like, oh my gosh, this is like a calorie free, drug free, like instant win. And you can really pair it with so many different rituals. And so the first thing in the morning I do when I go outside, I've got my citrus oils and I get my, I get the vitamin D I, I get outside in the sunlight. I'm helping to recharge my circadian rhythms and I get to breathe in this gorgeous oil. So it's a, it's an energizer bunny. Um, so any citrus oil will do that. And when you pair citrus and peppermint together, they're like an instant energy, like an energy creator, like they will give you instant energy like that. So instead of reaching for the extra coffee or reaching for the, the, whatever it is, the donut, the cupcake, yeah. thing, like you can get an instant energy boost because those oils hit that brain so fast and it'll just wake you up. Like if you find yourself being a zombie in front of your computer at three o'clock in the afternoon, have a little roller of peppermint and wild orange or cit whatever citrus, roll it on your wrist or roll it on your palms, breathe it in and voila. Um, I also love him for sleep. Obviously my son has his own diffuser in his room. So, and we have what we call his little, his little sleepy blend. So we sleepy blend him up with a little bit of lavender and Roman chamomile. And then we have a little combo that's lavender, a little bit of jasmine, chamomile, and cedarwood that we put in his, he has an elephant diffuser. So it comes out of its little nose. It's so cute. And it just smells, oh, it smells so good. So we have diffusers in our room and just, it tells him and it tells us like it is wind down time. It just kind of, it's one of those cues that tells your brain like, oh, it's time for me to like settle into my nighttime routine. Um, and then there's obvious oils that can help with tension, muscle tension. I've got like deep blue. I've literally two deep blue. Oh, good. oh my gosh. So, um, I, you know, as a, I told you, I had a lot of trauma as a little girl. So my neck is not great. I get a lot of care, but ever since I was seven, it just isn't good. And so I put a lot of deep blue on before our call, I put some deep blue on, but it like wakes me up too. Cause yeah. it's got peppermint and frankincense and all the things. And so the other thing that I love is cravings. Um, I don't love cravings. I love a solution to craving. <laughs> yeah. Um, and cravings are often an unmet need. You know, it's it's often it's stress, it's low energy, it's the blood sugar roller coaster. Let's be honest. Um, and it could even be our microbes that are just like they're unhealthy and not happy, right? Our gut microbiome is like screaming at you. And so one of my favorite oils for banishing cravings is peppermint oil. Like you just breathe that in. Um, and then you run from the kitchen, do that too, please. Um, you, you got to do both. You can't just breathe it in and just sit there looking at all that stuff. You know, eventually it's going to wear off. Run from um, the chips, people. Run, run from the from chips. Run. <laughs> I love Better yet. Uh, peppermint. I think yeah. I feel like it's good for so many things. Oh, so many things. Good. Menstrual cramps, headaches. Yeah. Chip cravings, <laughs> donut cravings. I um, smell it every up. time in a store. Oh, it's like so many so good. chemicals. I'm like. I know. <laughs> yes. It's so good. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Walking through it. I'm, I'm, I'm very chemical sensitive. So, yeah. um, so those are some of the things I, I love about like the different ways that we can, you know, if indeed 
let's be honest, habits are hard. That's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I love biohacking is that you've got thing, tools to measure. It's in real time. It, they can be game changers because it can really affect habit change, right? My husband's wearing a bunch of wearables right now. And man, he is majorly shifting his habits. I'm, I'm extremely, obviously because of my trauma, I'm extremely disciplined. I'm not going to pretend. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've, I've got discipline. It's really hard for me to understand why people don't just change. You know, you don't just, why don't you just give up alcohol? Just give it up. You know, like that's, I know that's not how it works for everybody. It's just how yeah. it works for me. Um, but I, so it's nice when you've got these wearables, but then it's nice when you have a tool that makes it feel better, that makes it feel easier, that gets you, you know, put, sets the tone for, for sleep, sets the tone for the morning, you know, can give you, you know, a, 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 a stress reset, you know, just carry, just carry lavender around as a stress reset or any citrus oil, or I personally love rose and, and jasmine as a stress reset, you know, and that can just help reset everything. You know, it's it, yeah, essential oils don't have oxytocin in them. I'm not going to pretend like I do, <laughs> but they can kind of feel like that. Sometimes they can kind of reset the system kind of like oxytocin can. And so I think having them around the house, leveraging them to support your rituals and your habits can go a long, long way. And at the very least, because they feel good and they smell good and they they can easily integrate into your world, they can feel like beautiful wins that that are only creating side benefits and not and not like side effects. I love that. It's true. It's true. All of these tools have been great that you've been sharing because they're actionable steps, different things you can utilize to help, you know, calm the nervous system, make you feel good. Um, so where I see your book in the back, menopause yeah. solutions, where else can people find you? Tell us a little bit about your book. Yeah. So this book is my, is my, actually my, my eighth, my eighth, yeah, eighth book. Um, and it's, so you know, girl. it is, it's a very root cause approach. I know that menopause, women are talking about menopause more and more. I think I'm so grateful. Um, yeah. but it's a very root cause approach. You know, it talks about, it just dismisses a lot of the myths. It really sets us up for success, but also there's chapters on repairing the gut and the liver. You're obviously addressing insulin resistance and blood sugar variability, energy, sleep, libido. I mean, name it. It's a very root cause, very functional approach to addressing the symptoms. I'm not going to pretend like there aren't symptoms in perimenopause and menopause, but it's the approach and how we handle it and getting to the deeper root causes of why they are and, and to not ign stop ignoring or the normalization of like, oh, this is just how it is. Right. Like, let's get to what's going on here and address it um, from that root cause approach. So stress. So a big part of the book focuses on stress, sleep, gut, um, and blood sugar balance. And then it's got a 21 day protocol. It's got oil recipes for all of these, for all these areas of focus, including like a liver blend. Um, but it's the 21 day protocol that I really love because it's focused. It's really focused on the liver, the gut, balancing blood sugar and reducing inflammation. So it's a really metabolic anti-inflammatory approach to healing our body while we're, you know, while we know our hormones are shifting and changing in a, in a way that, um, that just really sets us up for success in our 50s, 60s, 70s and beyond. Perfect. And yeah. you have a, a supplement bonus guide, right? For everybody. Yes. So like essential oils, I think that some su supplements can be so, so critical, especially adaptogenic herbs for women. And then the non-negotiables like right, magnesium, vitamin D, omegas, probiotics, digestive enzymes. Like I am, I feel like digestive enzymes are just the unsung hero of, yeah. of supporting our digestive really system. Are. And so I have, I talk a lot about those types of supplements about like, what's going to really move the needle for us. So that is all of like your top critical hormone balancing supplements, especially for perimenopause and menopause. Girl, I see your Stanley cup. I got about two of them. I, I'm a sucker for these babies. Oh my goodness. I have many <laughs> ones. I have my, and you know, my son, he wants all, all of mama's drinks. So we, yes. yeah. <laughs> whenever they go on sale, you know, I'm oh, like, girl, I'm like, oh, buy them up, it. buy them up. Yes. I buy them. For, I think I've bought like a dozen of them for my mom, my best friends. Everybody's got one. I feel like it's gotta be, it's like the mom, every mom's gotta have one. And it's great because it's 40 ounces and it's got yes. a, you know, a thin thing for the cup holder. It's so perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So Marita, what's the name of your podcast and where can people find you, your website and your Instagram and all that? Um, it is essentially you. We just crossed over um, 500 episodes, 7 million downloads. And it's literally, wow. 
You want an episode on growth hormone and how to optimize it? I got it. You want an episode on testosterone and how to optimize it? I got it. If you want the, the six cardiometabolic health risks that are unique to women, I covered it. You know, so that's, those are the topics that I'm doing the nitty gritty in of like the stuff that so many of us like, no, you're not going to get this from your doctor. You yeah. no one's going to have this conversation of like, oh, you're not feeling super great. You're feeling flabby. You're feeling off. You're, you're not being able to maintain muscle mass. Let's look at your growth hormone. Let's look at fasting insulin. Let's look at testosterone and DHEA. Why are we having those kind of conversations, you know, with, with in, in the doctor's office. And so that's literally what the show is, is it's focusing on women's hormones. It's a very female centric metabolic centric podcast that like cuts to the core. You girls were just on it, by the way, yes. 12,000 listens so far. <laughs> episode. So yes. That's um, great. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. And so, yeah, that's a great place. And then at Dr. Marisa on Instagram is a wonderful place to go and find me. I'm in my DM. So you can holler at me there too. <laughs> and we'll link all this stuff guys. And don't forget to download that supplement bonus guide. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I love you. You're so amazing. You're always so well-spoken and you gave so much for people to take away. And we love that in these episodes. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. And if you love this episode, please leave a review. It only takes a couple minutes and you can find out more about us on drbeckycampbell.com. And you can follow us over at Instagram on at health babes podcast at Dr. Becky Campbell and at Dr. Crystal Hone. Have an amazing day.